we are now officially live. Yay! Live and on the air, ready to broadcast for another live Q&A. Awesome! Every single week, as you guys know, we do these uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here to answer all of your, or as many as we can, of your aquatics questions and other related uh, pet questions where we can. Uh, we have our aquatics enthusiast and video host, Thomas, here. And I'm Brian, the video dude. He is. He's, he's the reason our videos kick so much butt. Okay, yeah, I'll take the credit. I'll take it. Thanks, We're man. a team, buddy. We're a team. Without you, I am nothing. Without I, you, I am nothing. That's a quote from I, Howie. I fully agree. I fully Except agree. Except for he was talking about his hook. Right. But you're my hook, Brian. I'm, your, I'm the hook to your Maui. Yeah. Nice. That was sweet. Uh, so how <laughs> you doing, man? I'm good. Feeling good. Uh, I had a rough night, buddy. Yeah. And not in the fun way. Uh, my my son, who is very young, is teething like crazy, and he did not sleep good. And uh, yup, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, my uh, my kid was the same. I was up for like four hours last night while he cried, and I let my wife get some sleep. So we're both feeling a okay today. Yeah, ready to rock, <laughs> sharp as a spoon. Yeah, but we're here. Uh, so let's uh, let's I guess jump right into it. Let's do this. Okay, well then, uh, let's see here. Should I use meds while quarantining? Ick and uh, ick and general cure. How to remove excess meds from water and how do I know that they are removed if not using meds? How to know if the fish have internal pests? That seems like a lot of questions in one. It, I, yeah, it's almost one comp, just one complicated question. So, okay, first off, I personally don't medicate fish unless I see that there is a reason to. So even if I'm bringing in new fish, uh, I typically won't medicate. That being said, um, well, until that I see in quarantine that there's a reason to give the medication. Um, but that being said, a lot of people who bring in wild caught animals will often medicate for internal parasites because wild caught specimens will often have some amount of internal parasites in them. Um, and you definitely don't want anything that they have potentially affecting your fish in your aquarium, especially if your other fish are captive bred because they probably won't have the same uh, immune system as a fish that's in the wild. So they may fall victim uh, and potentially die from ailments that the other fish bring in that don't kill those fish because their immune systems are already built in such a way to uh, fend them off. Uh, so that said, uh, if you're looking for internal parasites, first of all, you inspect the fish visually from the outside, look within the gills, look within the mouth. You also want to look at the fish's excrement, waste, poop, dookie. Uh, you want to look at the fish poop, and depending on how that looks, like for instance, it'll often be stringy and uh, clear or white if they have internal parasites, or sometimes you can even see the little internal parasites hanging out of their bums, which is yucky. Yeah. It is gross. But yeah, obviously if you see something, you want to treat for it. Um, beyond that though, uh, I, I try not to medicate fish if I don't have to. So how do you remove medication from water the easiest uh solution is just carbon and you'll use you know a good helping of fresh carbon uh run it for 24 to 48 hours and that should effectively pull out all the medication in the water if you use enough carbon and uh what was the last part of that question uh, how, how do you know i, I kind of already yeah. answered that so yeah. that's how you remove the carbon or pff, remove the medication with carbon when you're done medicating awesome Next up, how old uh, to sex uh, uh, Blue Nose, Blue Nose Pleco, I guess? Blue Nose. Blue Nose, BN? I don't know, I'm guessing. Bushy Nose. Right. Bushy Nose. <laughs> and Cistrus. Um, uh, I can usually tell by the time that they're about two and a half to three inches. Uh, I've had females trick me into thinking they were males at first and vice versa. So I kind of wait until they're bigger and then it's really obvious. Um, I don't know of any other tricks. I haven't uh, personally looked into it too hard because I haven't gone into breeding them on purpose. So I don't usually, uh, you know, don't usually look at whether or not they're girls or boys because it, it ha I haven't needed to for my own personal use. But uh, yes, they're pretty distinguishable once they're about two and a half to three inches. It's hard to mix them up at that size. Cool. Uh, are cyano catfish good to go with African cichlids? Absolutely. Uh, my favorites probably... Um, Sino Petricola and Multiplunctatus. I think they look really, really cool, uh, especially mixed in with Africans. Um, but you can also go with uh, ones like Angelicus, which are really, really awesome as well. I actually had a pair of Angelicus that I gave away to a friend of mine before I moved to Nova Scotia, and now they live happily with his Africans. Oh, 
That's nice. Yes, he sends me pictures every once in a while, and I get to go, aw, I miss those guys. He also has a gorgeous pair of leopard frog plecos that I gave him. I, I was intending to have him send them here at some point, but they look really happy, so I'm just going to leave them where so, they are. Sounds like you spoiled this guy, huh? Giving him... He's a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Lucky hey, dude. Kyle. I doubt you're watching, but... <laughs> Never know. He's out. I think he's at work. Oh, yeah. Sucker. Wait, so are we. <laughs> okay. Ha -ha! How to know if it's hole in the head disease or if my fish accidentally hit his head on a rock? Hole in the head leaves a pretty big hole in their head. Um, I can't say for certain if it's just starting. I believe hole in the head will usually start as a small white mark. I don't know how quickly it starts pitting the head though. So... Uh, I find that when fish hit themselves, they usually lift skin or scales and there'll be, uh, you know, like an indentation or a mark and then some lifted skin or scale. And that's how you could tell if they smack themselves real good. Uh, if you don't see that and it's just right where hole in the head would be, like around the eyes or the center of the forehead, and you're just starting to see like a white mark start to show up that's getting larger and larger, that might be hole in the head. Um, but you should... Uh, message our support team, send us a picture of Indeed. what you're looking at. Indeed. And we can much more accurately identify what it is for you. Yeah, I'm linking that email address in the chat now uh, in case you need more in-depth help than we're able to provide here. Uh, you can always reach out to the, our support team, a uh, bunch of other aquatics experts that work uh, at our head office who would be more than happy to help you uh, pinpoint what's wrong and, and how to get out of that mess. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, next up. Uh, thanks for the, and not really a question, I'm just going to say this one, because this sure. is nice. Thanks for the inspiration. I'm doing my first 300 liter low light planted tank. Plants have gone crazy. And I assume the inspiration he means our planted tank series, perhaps. Yay! Which we just dropped. Awesome. In, we just dropped a new episode of that yesterday. If you haven't seen it yet, after the live Q&A, go to our channel, check out the, uh, actually I'll link it as well. You can check out our newest planted tank episode. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty involved. Yeah, like, yeah. I think... A lot of you were asking for a little bit more substance with our episodes, so we made a chunkier uh, video for you where I kind of show you, uh, you know, what low-tech planted tanks or what plants work for low-tech planted tanks, uh, how I prep plants to be planted, and uh, how I planted that specific tank and what plants I used. And you even said, like, I remember you saying a couple weeks ago that this episode was going to be uh, pretty hefty anyway. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, regardless, it was going to be a, a beast. And it was. It's like almost... I don't know, like 17 minutes long or something. Yeah, but. and we actually shot it over two days because yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's tough sometimes to get it all crammed into a single day, especially when I'm taking my time doing things. So we film, you know, X amount of the process, but then either Brian has to kind of hang out and work on something else while I finish getting a part done so we can move to the next part, or uh, what we did that day was we broke it up into two separate separate days because it just made more sense. Yeah, but it turned out to be a pretty good video. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. So check Brian's that out. editing was awesome. I put some work into that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's I, one part in the video where I had like sketched by hand on my phone what I wanted the plant layout to look like, and Brian did an awesome job of overlaying it over top of the actual tank and kind of showing how it all came together. I was impressed. When I saw that part, I was like, Brian. Anyways. <laughs> I, do, I do what I can do when I can do it. Uh, so I've linked that in the chat. Check it out. Uh, my zebra snails are laying eggs everywhere. What kind of fish eat eggs but not the snails? It's so ugly with the eggs everywhere. Here's the problem. I can't think of any fish that eats uh, nerite snail eggs. They're extremely uh, calcious. They're, they're very hard little white specks. They're laid individually, which also sucks because that means they lay them all over the place as opposed to just a neat little cluster of eggs. Um, it's really hard to get off. Uh, what I've used in the past is just the edge of a razor blade and just kind of use that little tip of the razor blade to just pluck them off of whatever they're sitting on. That's, I, I wish I had a better method for you. I've not found one yet myself. Uh, yeah. It's tedious, especially on driftwood. Yeah. Holy. Oh, yeah, that'd be... I had a few hundred eggs um, in one of my planted tanks at one point. This is a while back, but... And I literally probably spent an hour and a half just plucking eggs off of that wood. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it awesome. gets a little fast. Awesome. They, they do such a great job at eating uh, algae. At what point do you, ever just give up, do you ever just give up and be like, whatever, these eggs are part of the aquarium. White man. dots? Yeah, like, ah, do you, or, do you, or do you just have to power through it? I'll tell you, I only plucked them off once. Yeah. And after that, enough. I <laughs> stopped caring. Yeah. I was like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> I'll enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs>
Uh, do you have to brace a rimless tank or can you get away without bracing? Thickness of glass or acrylic makes the difference. So if you're going to go rimless or, okay, let's say you look at two 10 gallon tanks. One has a trim on it or a rim and the other does not. You'll notice that the thickness of glass is different. Uh, I find rimless tanks are often almost double the thickness in glass that, than what you would typically use for that tank. Um, not in all instances, but in many. And it's just because, uh, depending on the dimensions of the tank, if you don't have the trim or bracing supporting the glass panels for bowing, um, they just have to be thicker so that they don't bow under that amount of outward pressure from the water. Cool. Um, just to address a couple <laughs> things here, someone mentioned uh, sipping on the good old moonshine. I promise this is just water. For it's our not. That is straight up vodka. And this is all kinds of rum and coke. No, it's not. We're just... If our, if our boss is watching, this is legit and just watering Coca-Cola. If he's not watching... Do you let your imagination fly? This is called Brian already had his Coke and now, is now hydrating. And this is me trying to get more caffeine into my system because of my uh, late night. There you go. Uh, and secondly, someone asked, uh, why is there hair on the wall behind you? Uh, back there. Oh, it, it actually fell off of the, uh, fell off of the duct tape. Uh, I had it hanging there. That's my Thomas by proxy right there. That's what that was my Halloween costume last week for our live stream. <laughs> if you haven't seen our Halloween version of our live stream last week, go check it out. I can link it here for you. I dressed up as Thomas, and now I'm, I'm just keeping it on the wall in case he ever like doesn't make it for whatever reason. If he can't come, I can dress up and and still do the live stream and try and answer any questions. I would love to see you try to swap between me and yourself. It would be awful. You, you and need awesome. to put the beard on a stick. So you could just, yeah, the little thumb thingy to make the mustache move. Bushy nose, plucker nose. I call it blue nose. I'm Indian. Anyway, okay. Whatever. Uh, next up, so that that addresses those questions there. Next up, the next question is: What's your opinion on the Exodon Paradoxus Bucktooth Tetra? How many should be kept in a school, and what size tank? Ah, uh, ah, uh, good question. Um, I haven't kept Exodons because I find they do probably best in a species specific tank uh, because they will mess up all the other fish that are with them. Uh, I believe Exodons are scale eaters by nature, so they will happily pluck all the scales off of their tank mates. Uh, I would say for Exodons, based on what I've seen in terms of setups that were successful with Exodons, you'd probably be looking at a decent school of them, maybe 12 or more, which I'm sure helps with aggression and prevents them from beating the snot out of each other. Um, and I'd probably put them in nothing smaller than maybe 60 gallons. Go up from there. They're messy eaters. Uh, especially if you end up going with live feeders. Hopefully you don't have to and you can give them something else. But if you do, uh, then, you know, any fish that's a predator and is going to eat uh, other fish or um, prepare, even if it's prepared meaty foods that are like frozen. I don't know if they can eat beef heart, but just as an example, something like beef heart or earthworms or silver sides, they're going to make a mess in that tank. So lots of filtration too. Cool. Uh, I'm new to the hobby. I am very stupid. I'm sure that's not true. Ah! You're new. You're going to make mistakes. Uh, I went out and got a 200 liter tank and some goodies and a bunch of fish. I had no clue you had to cycle the tank until I researched after buying the fish. What do I do? I'm going to start by saying research first Obviously. next time yeah. obviously yes not stupid just re make sure you do all your research first in my opinion and you know what you'd be surprised how many people don't understand that you can't just put like chlorine filled tap water and throw fish in and the fish yeah. be okay i would have never I, before starting work at big owls i like i wasn't a hobbyist or anything i wouldn't have known people do that kind of stuff all the time danny you're not the only one it happens unfortunately often and i put that onus on whoever sold you that tank and sold you those fish. It is their responsibility as sales staff uh, to make sure that you have the knowledge to care for your fish and to set up your aquarium. If they did not bestow that upon you, shame on them. Um, you're in a pickle now. So <laughs> if you don't already have a test kit, go grab one. The thing that is most likely to harm your fish at this point is ammonia. And uh, it's going to build up in the system very fast unless you have a way to get rid of it. So if you don't already have a bacterial additive, I would strongly recommend going out and getting one. If you have a store near you that has um, a product by uh, ATM called Colony for, uh, I'm assuming it's a freshwater tank, uh, Colony Freshwater for your volume, go get that. It's live nitrifying bacteria. It is basically going to be your best shot 
uh, to instantly get the bacteria in there necessary to break that down, uh, break that ammonia down. Um, you're also going to want to feed very, very little right now. So I would feed sparingly, and I mean literally once every other day, and just enough that all the fish get a mouthful of food. Uh, they can, you can feed them like that for a month, and they will be fine. You don't have to worry about them dropping off on you or anything like that. Uh, the reason you want to feed very sparingly is because the less food you put in, the less extra nutrients you're adding to the system and the less chance you are going to have an ammonia spike. Uh, once you test the water for ammonia, which you're going to definitely need to do, if your ammonia starts to get into the unsafe zone, you have to do a partial water change. You're going to want to make sure the water is almost identical in temperature to the water that's already in the tank. You're also going to want to add a water conditioner just to make sure you don't have any chlorine or chloramine or heavy metals in the water that are going to harm the fish. And uh, yeah, you're gonna wanna do those water changes the second that ammonia starts to even get close to uh, unsafe. Um, and it doesn't take a lot of ammonia, unfortunately, it's very caustic. And then uh, eventually you're gonna notice that your ammonia is gonna drop down to about zero, and then you're gonna start getting nitrates. That's when you've gone through your cycle. When your ammonia is zero and your nitrates start to come up, you are then safe, you can start feeding your fish normally, Again, monitor your ammonia for, for the next few weeks anyways and, and make sure that nothing's coming back and that your cycle truly is over. Um, and for water change size, it's gonna depend on how high your ammonia is. If it's getting really close, 50%. If it's uh, just starting to get a little bit high, but you've still got a good buffer before danger zone. <laughs> danger zone! Danger zone! <laughs> before danger zone, then um, you can do a 25% water change. And for now, I would do 25% a week minimum until you've broken that cycle, which sounds like a lot, but uh, with the amount of fish you have in there, you're never going to be shy of nutrients. Awesome. Uh, I, I think it's a, a very big coincidence that up here uh, in the chat before we just said that, someone asked, what is the danger zone? <laughs> it's amazing. Danger uh, zone! Now all I want to do is watch Top When you Pond. have a task kit, it'll show you on the task kit where the danger zone is. But and, you uh, have to sing it every time. Yes. This is a requirement, yeah. I think it says on the box. Usually it'll say like, save, caution. Danger zone! Brian, you are sneak attacking me with white paper. Yeah. You can't see this, but there's a roll of white paper above our heads that used to be the previous backdrop mm -hmm. and it's unfurling itself mm -hmm to try and attack me. Yeah, someone asked here, Joey, uh, who was that? It's our uh, good friend and our uh, frequent Joey Jones Aquatics. He's always here for our live streams. He awesome, asked, he asked, hey Joey. He said he just got here and there's a, why is there a bunch of tanks? I think he got excited about all the tanks in the back. It's because we had people, every stream was just the white backdrop because it's in my basement and I didn't really have any tanks set up. Uh, so we just had that white uh, photo backdrop. Uh, we got so many, not complaints, but people saying, yeah, yeah razzing yeah, us for not having a proper background. So now we got some, they're in a box, <laughs> but they're here. We got a bunch of stuff, uh, which will eventually actually be set up behind us. I do plan on setting, you know, these you guys called us. out Brian for not having a tank and saying he should have one. So now I have too many. So he's going to be setting up some tanks. Yeah. And they will be in the background of our live Q&As, but that's why they're there. Um, so that's good. You guys can uh, look forward to that. And we'll, we'll do a video on it, of course. We've, we've started filming, actually, a video on, on these, so that's good. Uh, next up, I have a wild-caught bass, and I'm feeding him red worms for his main diet. Is there any other foods you'd recommend to feed him? Okay, so here's the deal. Unless you are allowed in your state, province... Territory, wherever. Wherever you are, to keep native animals which if you're in the USA or Canada, I don't think there are many places you can. Um, I, I have to just say for the sake of political correctness and uh, making sure I don't uh, it, you know, support things that most people shouldn't be doing, you're not supposed to keep native animals and it's a plethora of reasons. But now that you have it, I can't even tell you to put it back because you could accidentally introduce something into the wild that could wipe out a population. So now that you have it, you're kind of stuck with either caring for it and hoping nobody ever finds out or uh, eating it. I am for either, I guess. <laughs> uh, that being said, um, I have had similar uh, species like peacock bass and stuff that were finicky eaters, um, especially wild caught animals. It can be tough to convert them. Um, that I've got onto things like freeze dried krill, uh, Bass in general are generally very attracted, especially when hungry, to top water movement. So what I've done in the past is taken said freeze-dried krill and enticed wild-caught, which I don't usually 
uh, purchase wild caught fish, but wild caught peacock bass standing across the other side of the room because they happened to be very skittish when I got them and literally chucking it in from the other side of the room. It would hit the surface of the water and then there'd be a big splash because one of the bass would go up and grab it. So if you want to try to get them off of some, uh, something other than just red worms or uh, earthworms and stuff like that. If you, you want to, you can try getting them on things like freeze-dried krill, uh, silver sides, um, other frozen food products or dry, like freeze-dried food products. That's what I'd probably recommend. You're, you're likely not ever gonna get them onto, or not easily get them onto things like pellets. I really don't think you'll get them on flakes. Maybe food sticks at some point, especially if you're chucking them from across the room. Once they start eating something and they get uh, used to the flavor and the visual of it and the smell in the water and all of that, they will generally just keep eating it. Fair enough. Uh, Darren Williams says, hey guys, just tuned in. How is everyone? Love watching your vids. We're Yay! Good. We're, we're good, Darren. How Solid. are you? We hope, you, you're, we hope you're good too. Uh, let's see. Swapping filters on a 29. How to hang on the back, now canister, have them running together right now to, awesome. to seed the canister. How long should I do this? Adding stability daily-ish also. I'm a two-week two week guy when it comes to um, switching filters. I think 14 days is plenty. Usually after two weeks, you know, your new canister is going to be seeded. You should be good. Uh, the other thing you can do, if you have any biomedia in the hang-on, uh, you can move that to the canister when you take the hang-on off just to make sure that it continues to have maximum bacteria. Maximum! <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, are Sino catfish nocturnal? How big do they get? Um, I will say I do see them at night, probably. At first, you'll see them at night the most often. Uh, however, I find cyanos will often come out whenever you feed the tank once they're used to it. And uh, did it say what do I feed them? What to feed them? Uh, how big do they get? Oh man, I am. Woo! <laughs> oh, I'm hearing things in my head. How big do they get? I mean, you can tell us what you how, what you feed them too if you want to. Oh, just all kinds of sinking foods. They're they they're not picky fish. Um, depending on the species, somewhere between four and like seven inches. I don't think I've had. Actually, feather fins might get bigger than seven inches. They might get up to like 12 or something. But yeah, the like Maltese and, and uh, Petrocolas don't get huge. I think around four to six inches. Somewhere in that bracket. Cool. I believe. Uh, hey guys, I just added six barbs to my 55 gallon. I have six Danios and two Angels as well, uh, which they are bullying. Any ideas on how to chill out the barbs? Nope. Chill, bro. <laughs> Just have a talk with them. Sit down. Like, dude, chill out. Barb's got no chill. God. That Barb's are notorious for this. Uh, if you're going to have a community tank that has barbs in it, you need to have other kinds of barbs. Um, or bigger fish that can outswim a barb. So, huh, I don't really have a good answer for you. Not you much. got barbs and you stuck them in with things that aren't barbs. Barb's going to be barbs. Get in the corner. Change. You get in the corner. You think about what you've done, you bully. Yeah. Will no. that work? No. No. <laughs> That was the only no, idea I had. Especially if you got like tiger barbs or something, they are awful for that kind of stuff. So sorry, I don't really have a good recommendation. You're kind of stuck than, with what you, what yes, you got. get rid of the barbs. Yeah. Uh, I have a three foot tank. Uh, what size filter slash pump should I be using? Three foot by what by what? Yeah. More, more info, my man. Yeah, or definitely woman. need more. Okay, cool. Uh, what's the best tank setup for blind cave fish? Blind cave fish? Man, seeing as they're blind, I've kept them actually. And you know what I did? I had them in a uh, tank. Uh, <clears throat> it was a tank with black gravel, black background that I wrapped around three sides. So the tank was almost pitch black on the inside. And then I put like glowing coral ornaments in it. And then I put an actinic light on top. So it's just a blue cool. light that kind of acts like a black light. So everything in the tank glowed. Uh, it was dark in there. And then there was just the Tetras. And they didn't know what anything looked like. They didn't care. They, they don't have eyes. So now <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really matter as long as they have uh, a little bit of structure in there. So like caves and stuff, they'll actually find their way in and out of them. They've got a really super keen sense of smell and an incredibly sensitive lateral line. So uh, they, do, they do pretty good with vibrations and stuff in the tank. They're... 
I never had any issues with them running into things and injuring themselves. Like they are remarkably. They're cool like the fish. they're like the daredevil of fish. Like they're no eyes, but all their other senses are heightened. Kind of super cool. Yeah, they are. The, that's a <laughs> wicked way to put it. They are. Um, they're they're pretty easy, undemanding fish. Uh, if you find some care sheets and stuff online for them, you'll you'll see that they're really not hard to take care of at all. Now I have a question because yes. they're cave fish, which generally have no light. If you keep a light, they don't care one way or another. They can't. They but can't but would but, but would light in in any way harm their you know nothing like that? No, no. adverse effect. Okay, cool. No. I don't know. They just they're like a pink white color because they have no real pigment. I guess they, I guess they're pitch black, so they didn't need it. Right, right. But it's not like they're not like vampires going like. Ah! Yeah. Okay. No, fantastic. that'll be all right. That would be heartbreaking. <laughs> Turn your light on your fish. <laughs> vaporize. Yeah. It Oops. just bubbles. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I, I keep doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you have any experience with Celestial Pearl Dan- Danios? I do. And what's your opinion of them? I love them. They're adorable. I actually, uh, I had a, a really nice school of them in with some Cardinal Tetras in one of my first high-tech planet tanks. Uh, <coughs> and I think they're incredibly cool fish. I, I've always said they look identical to little brook trout. They're like a brook trout if you shrank them down. The funniest thing about them, though, is they look really nice close up and don't look like anything if you're standing away from the tank. <laughs> but, like, there's some dots in the tank. Like, they, the color and stuff that they have is really not discernible at, like, a three-foot distance from the aquarium. <laughs> they're this, they're this big. So you got to get nice and close. But if you're going to do, like, a nano uh, tank or you just want a big school of really tiny fish, they're awesome. And I highly recommend them. Uh, they can be a little bit fragile. Fragile. I always say fragile. That's his way. Yeah, You'll know. learn the lingo. Anyways, yeah, so they can be a little bit fragile, but they're not too, too bad. I'm going to put so. out a glossary for your for your, your, your lingo. <laughs> fragile? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What how, else do how I have? to talk like Thomas. Uh, off the top of my head, what else do you have? Fragile is the, the most uh, common one. I don't know. I can't think. I'll have to go through all the videos because we have it's all on. Like we'll be doing a take and you'll say something like that and we'll be like, okay, cut. Let's redo it. You said fragile again. <laughs> Uh, I Thomas, can't help myself. A Thomas glossary. Uh, I'm doing 30% water changes daily. Should I do more? No, not unless you have to. Um, here's the thing. Oh, this is this the same gentleman who uh, had all the fish at once? I believe so. Danny? Yeah, Danny. Is this the same Danny? I think so, yeah. Uh, if you haven't tested for ammonia, test for ammonia and that'll tell you, you know, um, like if you're doing your water changes in the morning, test for ammonia by night and see where you're at. And also test for nitrate because uh, you could just like blow right past your your cycle and not even realize it. Or you could be taking out, I don't think you're going to take out too much nutrients at once in your situation. If you have a lot of fish in a small tank right off the hippity hop, uh, it's probably safer than not to do that. But yeah, get a test kit and test the water. Ammonia, nitrate, that's going to give you what you need to figure out whether or not you've gone over and cycled the tank. But you're not going to hurt anything doing 30% a day as long as the parameters um, are similar in terms of temperature and uh, that the, you know, temperature and pH and stuff. But if you put tap water in to start with, it's all going to be the same. You just need to dechlorinate it and make sure there are no heavy metals or other nasties. 30% a day won't hurt them. Cool. Uh, how many Corridoras for a 40 gallon alongside guppies and mollies and other community fish. What kind of Corridoras? Because they're all kinds of sizes. Um, I think you could probably do a dozen and be just fine. As long as you didn't get a dozen of the kind that gets four inches big. Fair enough. Or you could probably, you'd probably do more than a dozen if you're talking like wee little panda Uh What fish can I put with my Oscar? Huh, other Oscars. Other fish that are like Oscars. And you might not even be able to put other Oscars. If your tank started with that Oscar by himself this whole time, you're going to have a hard time getting other fish in with him. You'll probably be best off with catfish. Uh, plecos are pretty easy going. Uh, Cynodonis that we've talked about are great. Um, I'm trying to think of who else would stay out of the way. Uh, a ripsaw catfish. That gets way too big for most people's tanks. That's an awful suggestion. <laughs> Just has such a cool name, Ripsaw? though. Ripsaw? Yeah, they're, they're insane. Ripsaw! Cool. It's, it's Ripsaw! Yeah. yeah, it's basically like a giant, in disposition, like a giant quarry catfish. It's just enormous, and it's got these huge spikes down its body. 
which is why it's called a ripsaw catfish. Cool. But they also get like three feet long. Yeah? Yeah. So Does it hurt to pick them up? <laughs> if they thrash. Ooh, yikes. Um, what kind of net would you need for that? It's a bulletproof one. Oh my god. A Kevlar net. <laughs> no, a Kevlar gets ripped by knives. Uh, Nothing. <laughs> Nothing you can do with it. You get plexi, bully, bulletproof plexiglass net. That's just a tank. <laughs> Lower your tank in. Chainmail. Yeah. Nailed it. <laughs> nice. But yeah. Uh, catfish that are going to stay low and out of the way. I think plecos are a great, great example of what you can keep. Cool. Um, next up, we are halfway through, which means it's time. Yay! It's time for everyone's... The time where I get to think a lot less yeah. hard. Time for everyone's second favorite segment, apart from the actual Q&A, um, is... Sneak that in. All right. I thought of one more catfish. Raphael catfish, also known as the talking catfish. They're so much fun. I love them. That's another option you could probably keep with your... Okay, go. I get one segment. I get one. I know what I stole it! Here it is. Okay. You know what? Okay, so listen. This is what I learned this week. Uh, actually, I learned this a couple weeks ago, and I think I mentioned it to you, but it's really, really cool, and uh, it takes place right here where we live. Oh, yeah. Uh, what a big part of the, uh, big part of the whole uh, fact. So the fact is... Okay, we'll start with the fish. Zebrafish. Yes. Now, some people think the coolest fact about zebrafish is that they are a hybrid between zebras and fish. Very cool. Very cool. Like tiger sharks and, you know, right. that kind of thing. It couldn't possibly be a zebra, Daniel. No, no, no. It's a, it's a cross. Um, you don't know, now you know. Anyway, the coolest part about this is zebrafish. Like how they're, they're pretty small fish, right? They're like five yeah, or six centimeters, like, like pretty small little yeah, guys. Yeah, tiny little guys. Uh, not really uh, close to that close to humans genetically. There's other animals that are much closer to us genetically, but uh, zebrafish are um, helping in the uh, treatment, not cure necessarily, but treatment of cancer in human patients. Uh, they, uh, researchers at uh, Dalhousie University here in Halifax, um, researchers used to use mice a lot, still use mice a lot for you know testing different, all, all kinds of things uh, for science in general right. uh, and medicine, uh, but uh, it turns out that zebrafish, they're a lot uh, faster to be, ra you can raise them a lot faster, you can get a lot more of Generationally, them. Generationally, they reproduce Exactly, quicker. so it's a much more uh, much more convenient way for them to test. Uh, and because they have a lot of the same systems we do, they have, um, you know, their ears, eyes, like the digestive systems, all, the, all kinds of things that, you know, where we might get cancer, they also have those systems. So uh, there's the good through line of things. Oh yeah, you know, if they get, the, you know, ocular cancer or something weird. <laughs> We can test in this. So what they're doing with zebrafish that I thought was super cool uh, is that uh, patients uh, here, they do it a couple places throughout the world, but here as well. Uh, here in Halifax, let's say uh, someone, God forbid, gets cancer. Uh, let's say prostate cancer. What they can do... Oh, man. It's okay. Just keep going. It's all falling apart. Okay, so <laughs> uh, let's say that someone gets cancer. What they can do is uh, they can... Uh, take some of that cancer from the person, like take a sample of the cancer from the person who has it, inject it into the zebrafish, uh, and let it kind of take hold of the zebrafish. Uh, and what they can do is then... So they, they give the zebrafish they, they give the, the, that zebra, person's cancer. They give zebrafish cancer. Okay. That person's cancer. Like, it's very personalized, which is really neat. So they give the zebrafish that particular, those cancer cells. And then they can test on those zebrafish treatments. Like, so let's say they, what oh. what's most effective. So let's say there's like two different treatments for whatever kind of cancer. They can do both and say, okay, this particular cancer cell is responding good, better, worse, whatever. And they can then take that information and use it with a patient. To try to, to actually, treat them more effectively. That's incredible. That's one hell of a personalized gift. Yeah. Why get a, a locket with an inscription on it when you could give somebody a cancer zebrafish? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Very personalized. Your own zebrafish with your cancer telling you, hey, maybe try That's treating with this. I've always been blown away by how um, researchers and doctors find ways to help uh, treat what seems like almost impossible to overcome odds yeah. and do it in a way that's more effective with the help of nature. It's always with the help of nature. Yeah. Like for no matter how much we seem to do in labs and in experiments and playing with chemicals and the second we bring nature into it, it seems that things just start coming together faster. Even technology, how much technology in general is just based off of something that mother nature came up with first. Yeah. Like we're just trying to like copycat it and, you know, yeah, reproduce so, it as best we can. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I think it's 
a little sad, but also extremely helpful to use uh, something as easy to reproduce as a zebrafish to help figure out what is going to treat somebody's cancer most effectively. Yeah, and of course I was too busy yakking, I forgot I have visuals, which are really cool. So this is actually a photo of, uh, not a... Uh, not an actual, it's like an x-ray or something, of a zebrafish. And the little red dot there is actually the, the cancer cells that they inject into the fish. And so it carries that around and they test it. Um, we have here a group of some of the researchers with their, their zebrafish in a little tank uh, that they do their experiments on. And then, of course, we have uh, a little st workstation here where these are little embryos. So, they, so that's where they inject. That's them. where they inject. Uh, and then they do all their studies. So that was some of the stuff that I was uh, checking out. And I thought, wow, super, super cool. A very cool way to... Yeah, again, not really cure cancer. I mean, it, there are applications for that, but mainly they're using it here, how to treat individual particular cases of cancer. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, really, really neat. So that's what I learned, uh, not just this week, but the last few weeks, and I thought that was super cool. So uh, with that said, uh, I guess we can get back to the questions, not back to the, you know, the part everyone's here for. <clears throat> now um, I want zebrafish just for like the, the awesomeness. Yeah. That they have the utility. And I wonder like if you get a, a zebrafish that like, let's say you try the, the whatever treatment and it cures the zebrafish, and it's you know it's it's cured and alive. Then do, what do they do with that fish? Do they? It's your gift. Yeah. Do they do they give it to the person to keep? Because that's pretty neat. I don't know. Awesome. Something something cool to think about. Your little like your little mascot buddy. Yeah. That they've you get you guys you, have you been both survived that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of neat. Uh, stupid question: Is there some kind of fish that eat dead fish? Like if I don't see the dead fish, I want to know what the fish. Almost all fish. Uh, the smallest kind. Okay. She says uh, the smallest fish in my 142 gallons are five centimeters. Almost all fish will, like if you have a fish die in your system, you will, and you have the pleasure of finding its body, you'll usually find your other fish picking at it. So there's a corpse on the ground and they are just going ham, trying to eat it. And it's naturally when fish see another sick or weak or dying fish, they tend to gravitate towards making it go away. So there are instances where people will lose a fish and never find a body. You may find pieces of skeleton at some point uh, if it gets kicked out from behind a rock or while you're gravel washing or something. Uh, but it is quite possible for your fish to just essentially disappear because all your other fish ate it when it passed. Without a trace. Gone. Uh, sometimes the only trace, like I've had, uh, you know, done work on people's tanks. Like I, there's a, an office in Vaughn that I actually did some um, maintenance for, for a little while. And they were telling me they had this pleco in the tank and they couldn't find it. And one day during maintenance, I like pulled all the ornaments and stuff out. This hard front uh, skeletal, it's almost like a carapace because plecos have that armor. Just like the front part of the armor was white and floating around after I lifted up a rock. So it had been completely destroyed by everything else in the tank after it had passed. Inevitably, I guess it had passed. Um, or yeah, inevitably. I don't know, whatever. So anyways, uh, yeah, you may not find a trace or you may find the front half of a pleco, if that's what died. But if it was a molly, you probably won't find any. Uh, next question, can I use RO water for betta fish? You can, but you have to remineralize. Blah, 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 blah. Re mineralize you got it. this, buddy, you got this. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> We're so supportive here. Um, so you need to add something back to the RO. Otherwise, fish don't typically do well in a completely uh, mineral devoid uh, or salt devoid fluid. Reason being, if I'm, and this may be anecdotal, but I believe what I was, Brian's just really on point. <laughs> Keeping it profesh today. Yeah, yeah. Keeping so, it profesh. My, my kid was up late last night. I'm tired. Yeah, Give yeah. Me we're both, we're in the same boat. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it was, that was a bad night. Okay, I'm gonna start over. You can use RO, you have to remineralize it. So you have to add something like RO right, or uh, I think equilibrium is the version from Seachem, back to the water to raise the mineral content to what a uh, normal uh, water mineral content would be. Because if you put mineral devoid water in the tank, it can suck the minerals or salts out of the fish. I was also saying that might be anecdotal because this is uh, something I was told a long, long time ago and I've never actually done the research on it, but I have. Uh, heard many times people losing their fish from putting them in directly into RO water and only doing water changes and et cetera with RO. So I would avoid it. Always remineralize. That's the safest thing to do. What's the best fish to, to pair with Neon Tetra for a 16 gallon? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> that is subjective. Um, 16 gallon Neon Rainbows. 
One neon rainbow, maybe two. Why neon rainbows? Oh, What's they're the just best? they're just pretty. Neon okay. tetra, neon rainbow, mm. blue and red. So uh, neon tetras are kind of clear with a blue stripe on their back um, over their eye, and then a little bit of red, I believe, by the tail. Uh, unlike cardinals, which actually have the red that goes all the way across. And then uh, neon rainbows have a blue sheen to their body and then reddish orange on the fins. So it's like a, the opposite. The red's not in the inside, it's oh, on the outside. And they're nice. a little bit bigger and they are very interesting to watch. They, if you, especially if you have two, they, and two males. If you have two males, it's fantastic. They will flash to each other. They have a flat portion of their head that uh, is usually kind of like a brownish color, but they can change it to beige and yellowish. And they'll flash at different colors and they'll be sparring with each other. I've never seen them that's actually hurt funky. each other. Yeah, they're really interesting fish to watch. Mm. So cool. That's what I would do. <clears throat> a community tank slash low tech planted, uh, hanging at eight to eight point two Holy. in pH. Worried about adding any any new fish due to basic pH suggestions or tips. <sighs> What is making your pH that high? Uh, is it the rock in the tank? Um, do you have really high pH tap water? Something's doing it. And if you can figure out what it is, you can try to combat it. If it is like the rock work in the tank, the easiest thing to do at that point is just work around it because no matter what you do to try to lower the pH, if it's the rock, it'll just buffer it right back up. So you're better off looking for fish that can deal with a higher pH without it interfering with them. Cool. Uh, next up, uh, do you recommend sand or gravel for delicate plants, plant roots like Cuba? I recommend, I have actually used um, Eco Complete. I, I don't truly like sand on its own, although sand is definitely going to be easier for those roots. It's uh, prone to compacting over time, which can, and it's such a pain to work with if you ever need to pull plants out and replant them, and you'll just kick up sand and dirt and dust and but um, I've used Eco Complete for uh, dwarf baby tears and uh, similar species, and it's worked incredibly well. It's thick enough that, and I do dry start when I'm using that stuff for carpeting plants. Uh, the dry start method is something we'll probably talk about. I'll probably do it in the high tech series just to uh, show how I do it and how it can be done. But um, yeah. I, I like the eco eco complete, um, or you could probably do it with something like Tropica's. Uh, it's like aqua soil essentially. It's pelletized soil, but they have a th fine version of it as well. That's uh, much smaller pellets, and that would obviously work really easily as well. But straight sand, no. Especially if it's just regular aquarium sand, I would never do it. You want something uh, planted specific. It's a lot better for the plants themselves. Um, and same with gravel. Don't use straight aquarium gravel. Use something specific for plants. And I think equal completes a great middle ground. Cool. Uh, I have one little thing to, to mention to bring up. Uh, so we live in Nova Scotia, away from where we used to live in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, I have my, my folks here visiting. We do. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're visiting uh, me and my family for... I say we because I'm here. Right yeah, now. yeah, you're here and hanging out and they came to see you too. So they, um, they're here. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I can hear upstairs. I hear like feed. I'm like, why am I hearing our, our stream? I think my parents are upstairs watching this right now. Hi, mom and dad. Just so you know, hi. It's cool to, that you're here and watching. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I wanted to mention. You know, you know what's really funny is right before we right before we came downstairs to do this. What did my mom say to us? Have fun, boys. Have fun, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh man, I've never felt like more of a kid in my life. I, I know. I, I instantly went back to like 17 years old. Yeah. You know, like I'm just waiting for her to bring down like chocolate milk and potato chips or something. Cookies. Yeah. For us. Yeah. Here's Pie some cookies. Cake. Oh man. Hey, mom, if you're still watching. <laughs> Meatloaf. Just a suggestion to help get us through this. Uh, um, so anyway, so I mentioned that, uh, but we'll move on now. Uh, <laughs> moving my community to a 36 gallon tank in lieu of Black Friday. I think it was like an anticipation of Black Friday. Low-tech planted tank water, column plants, driftwood. Making my fish happy and healthy is priority. What can I do to cultivate live food? Lots of stuff. Uh, the, probably the easiest live food to start with, if you want to try your hand at live foods, is brine shrimp. And there are all kinds of brine shrimp hatcheries and brine shrimp solutions. You can even purchase prepackaged like uh, portions of egg and already the salt that you're going to need for a specific volume of water. In little pouches it's super easy to cultivate um, there's tons of tutorials online tons of uh, write-ups online on how you can 
cultivate live brine shrimp and it is a, a good food for your fish there's almost there's like no fish on the planet that i can think of uh in the aquarium trade that's going to refuse live brine shrimp except for maybe a comp oh my <laughs> this is amazing yay thank you so much we got it cookies thanks mom thanks mom awesome this is the best live stream ever yeah unless it's a fish that only eats plant matter they might not go for it but i mean i've even seen plecos go for live foods so man your mom is awesome i know right thanks for watching mom uh, one of my clownfish is aggressive to new fish. What can I do to calm him down? I think it's another, is this another example of, well, you're kind of stuck with what you got unless you okay. switch the other fish around him? Our, our, how big is the tank is going to affect this? What species of clownfish is going to affect it? If the other fish are in the same, uh, you know, roadhouse, boathouse, house, shack, <laughs> they're in the same family, uh, it's going to make matters worse. So if your other fish are damsel species... Good chance your clownfish is just not going to ever like them. Um, and if you end up, unfortunately, if you end up with a clownfish who just wants to fight everybody in the tank and you cannot get them to stop, you may have to, uh, you know, find a different clownfish. Take that one back to the store or find a fellow hobbyist who's looking for a mildly aggressive clownfish or severely aggressive clownfish and um, start with another one once all the other fish are in the tank. Uh, clownfish, like I said, depending on the species, usually pretty easy to, to uh, work into a community of other saltwater fish, especially if we're talking other small reef fish. Um, but they will have problems and take issue with other clownfish and other damsels in the tank, whether it's the same species of clownfish or others. Usually the only way you can get many clownfish together is in a harem type tank where you get a whole whack load of babies all at once. And I mean a lot, like... 12 to 24 kind of deal let them all grow up together there will be aggression within the group but if they're always together they will figure it out they will kind of create a pecking order and there's enough fish that the uh, aggressions disperse etc etc other than that you can hope for a bonded pair and uh, if you get a bonded pair then you can have two clownfish in one tank pretty easily there are obviously instances and somebody i'm sure will bring it up there are obviously instances where people have tanks with multiple different species of clownfish and maybe only three or four different clownfish in that one tank together and they're getting along okay good for you that's difficult to do it's not easy it's definitely the exception and not the not the rule so but yeah if your clownfish is being a jerk yeah all right, so we have um, uh, more or less 10 minutes, uh, maybe another maybe another 15 minutes before uh, this wraps up, I think. Sure. Uh, so I say we uh, hit lightning round and uh, just kind of motor through as many of these as we can. <laughs> okay, here we go. Awesome. Uh, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure when I have a planted tank. I'm not sure when I have a planted tank and use fertilizer. Is it better to remove activated carbon from filter and only use purigen or can I keep both? I honestly don't run chemical filtration on a planted aquarium unless I have a reason to. That said, I would probably take purigen over carbon. Either way though, if you're dosing and you don't have a reason to really have purigen or carbon in there, like if unless you're specifically trying to pull something out that you know is already there, just take them out. Uh, what's your opinion on the weather loach? They're really cool. Uh, you need a really tight top because they will in, uh, when the pressure systems or weather systems move in your area, they will fly around the tank like crazy loaches and try to jump straight up. So tight, tight top. Uh, what are the best hang on, hang on the back filters for reef aquariums? Is Seachem any good? You know what? I was just about to say, <laughs> I was reading the comment. I'm like, ah, beat me to it. Yes. I think uh, for a reef tank, the Seachem uh, tidal filters are incredible. They have a lot of useful features on them that you won't find in, in most other uh, hang ons. And they really were designed for saltwater. I think a really good alternative, just based on the fact that it's just a really easy to use uh, kick butt uh, hang on filter is AquaClear. Cool. Uh, oh, this person's following up with the dimensions of their tank. Just asked about filter slash pump size for my three foot tank. The dimensions are, uh, it's a 35 inch long, 12 and a half inch wide, 15 inch high. Okay, 35, uh, 36, 12, 15. So what is that like? Thirty-five gallons, something like that. Um, I would probably do. Uh, 
Eheim Classic 2215. Classic. That's just my. It's a classic. I love classic. Like, if you ask me for a filter, I will point you to an e Hunt classic. Yeah, pretty much every time people ask you, you that's your go to. Yeah. I just. Unless they're... they have certain requirements that they can't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, what is your opinion on feeding feeders to larger predator fish? Is medicating them first sufficient? Whoa. Uh, yes, you have to quarantine and then potentially, you don't have to medicate, but at least quarantine your feeders before you give them to your fish for an appropriate period of time. And it's going to sound like a really long time, but I would do two to three weeks before you actually feed. So you'd need a pretty big uh, tank so you can quarantine and feed from it. And then whew, I don't like feeding live for that exact reason. But the other thing is you want to feed your feeders a decent quality food because whatever you put into them, you're putting into your fish. And if you have to medicate your feeders, then do it. Because the last thing you want to do is hurt your precious fish by introducing bacteria or ailments, uh, fungus, God forbid, um, and hurting the rest of your fish. Quarantine's important, especially with feeders. Cool. Uh, next up, I have six Neon Tetra in my tank. Now I gave them too much food, uh, which are at the bottom of the tank. What should I do? Siphon it out. Grab your gravel siphon and siphon out any extra food. If you can't skim it out with a net, uh, siphon it out. Cool. I planted my first tank uh, 14 days ago and I've never added food to it. I'm going to the pet store in four days to test for nitrates. Am I doing something wrong or? 14 days, never added food. If you haven't added any sort of nutrient to the water to encourage bacteria to establish themselves, you probably haven't cycled the tank at all. So you, you're, you're probably going to want to go in and get a bacteria and feed that bacteria with something. Um, you could even do it with a starter fish, like get one of whatever fish you intend to keep, uh, throw that in the tank, um, and just keep, keep an eye on it, be diligent, test the water, and uh, feed sparingly, and also continue to add a bacterial additive, and you should do a fish, like a cycle with fish, um, without ever having an ammonia spike. Do you recommend a clown yellow, a clown yellow clown goby or a yellow watchman goby for a 20 gallon with two clownfish, two nasaria snails, and two fire shrimp? Mm -mm 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 -mm. I would say uh, I would do probably the yellow clown over the watchman. Um, but I would go even further and say look for the green. Uh, clown gobies with the red spots. I can't remember their exact name, but they're green, tiny little green guys with little red spots. They are cute and ugly at the same time. Uh, they don't generally harass coral and they are small and easy to manage. And you could have one in a 20 gallon and not affect the overall water chemistry very much at all. Coolio, coolio. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, a lot of people just interacting, which is awesome to see. Hey, can can you use vermic? I don't know what vermicompost. Do you know what vermicompost is? Vermicompost for low tech planet tank. I'm assuming that's some kind of substrate. I have no idea because I don't know what vermicompost is, and I apologize. But if it's basically just dirt, then technically you could, most likely, as long as there's nothing in there that's going to hurt the fish. Cool. Uh, is a Finex Stingray okay for low, medium, light on a low-tech 29-gallon planet tank? Here's the deal. I don't uh, have any experience with Finex. Um, just haven't had the opportunity to use a Finex light. Uh, that said, I know Finex is a pretty trusted brand in the plant tank community. People use them all the time, especially the Finex Planted Plus lights. Um, so I'm going to say you could probably do it with a Finex. Uh, I would probably... Generally, rather than going down the Phoenix line, I usually go with Current USA. Um, I think they're pretty comparable. Uh, I do find that, based on what I've read, that the fit and finish of a Current USA is a little bit superior to the Phoenix. Um, I'm sure the price is probably also reflective of that. Uh, Oscar with Peacock and Haps, okay? No. Two different environments. Also, Oscar is going to get way bigger and probably beat the snot out of everybody. Next. Next up, talk about mermaids. I like mermaids a lot. Uh, I watched The Little Mermaid 
uh, the Disney movie as a child. I just watched it the other day over with my... and over and over and over and yeah, over. Yeah, you know the songs like off by heart. Yeah, I and I was watching it with my three year old the other day, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. Actually, here, <laughs> here's an interesting factoid about me and my life. My wife actually uh, bought me the a Blu-ray like remastered copy of The Little Mermaid as a gift, mm, and nice. I love it. Yeah. I love I I love it. Yeah, he loves it. He does. I've heard you sing it. It's moving quite moving uh what are the freshwater spider crab good for the tiny one you know can they live with fan shrimps like the bamboo shrimp what are the bamboo shrimp good for how many in a 142 gallon tank freshwater spider crab i have no idea what a spider crab is common names are the worst um bamboo shrimp I think are a type of fan shrimp and they're really good at looking cool but beyond that they don't do a heck of a lot for you um, other than give you another thing to feed and appreciate mm. I'm, ass- I'm gonna assume the crabs are in the same boat they're something that looks really cool and is a little bit different but doesn't really benefit in any way shape or form and then you have to like crayfish and uh, fiddler crabs are technically uh, brackish but I had vampire crabs, which are really cool. You yeah. Oh, yeah, the, the video we did. Crabs? Oh, yeah. Those we did are a setup for neat. them. They are incredibly cool little crabs and truly freshwater and very easy to work with. And, uh, yeah, tons of fun. Take a look at that cute, video. Cute as a button, if I remember <laughs> They correctly. look evil, but they're purple and yellow and black. Yeah, like they are very, really very cool. cool. Uh, what would you recommend, Thomas, on how many sponge filters I should have in my 90-gallon tank? <laughs> You should get an Eheim 2217 canister filter. Shocker! Uh, I honestly don't use sponge filters unless I'm going to be doing a bunch of water changes and it's kind of just like like what you'd expect to see on um, discus tanks where you'd have a bare bottom discus tank, two gigantic or sometimes up to four gigantic sponge filters and you're doing like water changes every day. So I'm going to say two really, really big ones and lots of water changes. Cool. I'm just uh, linking that Vampire Crabs video in the chat for anyone who wants to check it out. Pretty cool little vid. Um, next up, uh, the wife wants a flower horn. How should I set up our 75 gallon? Can we fit two in there? Flower horns are pretty aggressive. They don't often like each other very much. Even when they are paired, males can be pretty nasty towards their girls. They're not always very good partners. They're not always gentlemen. Um, so I would recommend having one per tank. A 75 gallon is a great size, especially if you're gonna be keeping one until adulthood, they can get to be a fair size. Um, that said, I have, uh, I've always kind of been a fan of just doing like a bare bottom black background and a nice uh, color intensifying light for flower horn tanks. Uh, I think it's a really nice way to appreciate them. They don't really care about having el- anything else in the tank. Uh, you're not displacing any water volume with gravel and stuff at that point. You can see all the waste on the bottom of the tank as it comes, and it makes it a lot easier to keep them clean because they are a hungry, dirty fish, uh, but also super interactive. They're like puppy dogs. So, you know, yeah, all right. that's how I, that's personally how I would do it. I know it's not the most enchanting aquarium but when you get something like a flower horn the focus is really on the fish like you get a flower horn because you want to see that flower horn not so much because you're gonna make like a fancy aquarium and then stick a giant fish in it yeah although you could easily do that as well if that's your jam i ain't judging but i, think, I, support, I, think, I support your decision i think the flower horns that were at the office there was always in a like very basic setup yes. and just like yes. the flower horn was the showcase you were just like whoa you walk in and your eyes are right on that even when uh chi and i had moved them into the 90 gallon mm-hmm. together and they they bred we 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 went to a store each bought one i knew from it being this big i had this feeling in my gut that it was a female just based on his and mine and how they look different and then they grew up and one was male one was female and then they bred and they had babies Come, come full circle. You remember those days, Chi? Oh, good times, huh? Yeah. Speaking of breeding, what size does a male dwarf grommy have to be to breed? No idea. I'm assuming adult size. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why that was so funny, but it was. I really liked it. Uh, and, now, and now you made me lose my spot in the chat. Because you know they're asking for something more precise than that. 
I just don't have the answer to that. No, that's fair. All right, I'm just going to... I lost my place here. Let's go to the next one if I can find it. What? Oh, we're super close. We're super close. Um, yeah, we still got a few minutes. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, can you mix African peacock, Africans, Peacock, and Mabuna? Oh. Maybe? I know there's something about mixing malawi with others and causing a malawi bloat but i can't remember how that goes i don't know if josh is in the uh chat today he was i haven't seen him i'm not sure if he's uh, still uh still... josh would have that answer on the tip of his tongue i think yeah no i think he's oh no and that's that was me yeah no i don't know if he's still out hanging around man i can't remember but i know you should be careful and sticking uh to one lake is always the easiest uh road to success so if you want Malawi, stick with Malawi. If you want Tan Tanganyika, stick with Tanganyika. If you want the other Mabuna. kind, I don't know. I don't know if Mabuna is a species or a lake. I can't remember. <laughs> it's it, it was a rough night, Bri. I, yeah. can, I am just not all there. My like encyclopedia of information feels just a little bit further. I feel like I'm running between books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a library, but each book is like got all these, 13 like, meters away from the last you've book. You've got all these like filing cabinets in your head, and they're just like in this Every vast warehouse. Every single one is locked, and yeah, the yeah. keys are on the other end of the room. <laughs> uh, but you're doing your best, and you're doing pretty well. Hi, I accidentally crashed my tank last night. Yikes. I did too much of a water change. Yikes. Half my mollies died. Yikes. Really sorry to hear that. Uh, what can I do to save the other half? They're swimming and eating, but not as active as normal. Oh, just try to prevent any more change uh, in their water chemistry than they've already underwent. I'm really sorry to hear you had a crash. It's funny, people often talk about how, you know, we did that uh, aquarium top 10 do not, yeah. that video, and all kinds of people were like, you don't have to wait to do this, or you don't have to do it like that, or this way. This is exactly why I say that you shouldn't do more than X percent water change or you shouldn't do a water change to clean your filter on the same day because of disruptions of bacteria levels and all that right stuff. um because instances like that happen and it's really unfortunate i'm yeah. really sorry that it happened to you and i know how bad it sucks to watch your fish just decline and start crashing on you so um for now just monitor them closely test the water uh make sure the temperature is okay one of the fastest way to send fish in a shock is uh temperature change and doing really large water changes uh, that's one of the most common ways that they end up perishing. Another one is from pH shock, uh, which if you don't do a water change for a very, very long time, biological processes will actually lower your pH uh, lower than it would otherwise be because the, those biological processes create acids. Um, and then if your tap water has a much higher pH, they could go into a potential shock from pH uh, swing. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of reasons why really big water changes have to be done very carefully. Uh, but they should, if they're doing okay, they're eating okay, they're acting okay, just keep an eye on what's going on, test the water, make sure nothing goes funky, and uh, they should recover. But still, sorry to hear yeah, that, man. That's that's, that is a bummer. Um, Brian, we need something, we need a pick-me-up. Oh, uh, well, this isn't a pick-me-up, it's just a general question. I'll look for one, though, a happy one. Can almond leaf lower the pH? Uh, I believe that ketapang and almond leaves can help... Uh, soften the water perhaps and lower pH. They, it puts tannin in, in the water. So I, I believe it can help. It will, it'll definitely help create black water and uh, it should lower the pH slightly. I don't know if it's gonna do it drastically, especially if you have something in your water that's keeping the pH high, but I believe it does. All right. Uh, how do you keep plants alive if you plant in a new system that isn't cycled? You don't have to try very hard. Um, there's, plants don't create waste in the same way fish do. Uh, and plants aren't, I, in my experience, to be quite as sensitive to things like ammonia as um, fish are. Fish will, you know, usually get messed up from ammonia before plants will. But uh, so you can plant a tank. The plants are going to actually change the way the cycle happens in a bit or in, in, in ways because they're going to help pull nutrients from the water as the fish are putting it into the water. So it can actually create a slower cycle or an unapparent cycle, which has happened to me before where I literally tested and tested and never got an ammonia reading and had nitrates starting to come up and they'd never even got high because the plants kept sucking them out too. So yeah. 
cool. Um, this isn't a question, just I'm going to read it. Uh, I like the Planet Aquarium series. Gave our family inspiration for our 10 tanks. Yay! What? Oh, no, there is a question here. Will you do one for a small saltwater tank as well? We would like to add to our collection. I will at some point do a small saltwater. However, um, there will be a saltwater build eventually. Mm. I don't want to say too much. Yeah, we should. Uh, There's a new build, new build coming. Ixnay on the alt it water. May, say. Yeah, it may, may or may not help answer some questions you may or may not have. May or may not. Now we did do, we did do a small saltwater mm -hmm. uh, tutorial, but it's not really like super uh, basic. Super basic. I know a lot of people when they watch it, well, whoa, that's not salt, but it is salt water. It's just it, to get you. Here's the thing. Used to. Yeah, people say it's not salt water. It is salt water. It's not a reef. It's yeah. not even trying to be a reef. Yeah, we actually we saw someone uh, someone commented yesterday saying, um, uh, "Oh, um, what do they say? Like ceramic corals or whatever? Like you know, fake corals?" I'm like, "Well, yeah, it's it's really it's a meant salt for... water tank." Not yeah. here's the thing, guys. Salt water is not harder than fresh water. Uh, in the same token, a planet tank is a lot harder than a regular fresh water tank with guppies in it. Just naturally, there's more things to learn, more equipment or additives involved. You're dealing with another organism that you're now caring for. In that exact same way, a saltwater tank is actually quite easy. The only difference is now you have to learn how to add salt to the water and put that in. Yeah, That's really the only massive difference. Um, as soon as you get into uh, reef keeping and you're keeping other organisms other than just fish, because that, that build we did is just for clownfish uh, and other small fish that are similar in hardiness. Um, but yeah, you know, if you want to start keeping those other organisms, there's a learning curve involved. There's other products you're going to want. There's other filtration methods you can use to help reduce the amount of nutrients uh, that are in the water. You need different kind of lighting. Like it's a different ball game, but it is still a saltwater tank, even if it's just gravel ornaments and a pair of clownfish in a salty, salty aquarium. Yeah. Okie dokie. Uh, well, I think we're... Pretty much at a at a racetrack here. Do you want to keep? You want to give it do a few more? Is there a few more? Oh well, there's a ton more. You know, we just haven't got to a lot of them today. There's oh, a lot wow. of people here asking questions. We want to do. Uh, let's do three more. Let's do three more. Three, three more. more. Okay. Um, oh, and of course I lost it. Let me uh, redo. Uh, what is the best canister filter for a 55 gallon? <laughs> you have classic. Uh, uh, if you want a different answer, uh, I would say that you could do a Eheim Pro 4 canister filter. Wow, cool. Really went off the beaten path there. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, um, let's see. Emergency. Well, this yes. Is, this should be going. My tank's been going for a month. It's a 15 gallon and a few plants started to rot. So Yikes. I took them out and my nitrate went up to six Yikes. parts per million. I guess he's asking, is there anything he can do? There's no water question change. there, but. Water change. You gotta do a water change. So I would, uh, man, sorry that happened. But um, Tom, what I would do is I would do a 30% water change and uh, just keep an eye on what's going on in that tank. If you have a test kit uh, for nitrate and nitrite as well, just have a peek at what's going on there. Okay. Uh, how old should goldfish fry be before they can be uh, transferred to no another tank? No idea. Right, so Here, here's what I would then. say about most fish fry. Um, I will, <clears throat> if the fish are free swimming and able to eat, free swimming is the key thing. They have to be able to move on their own before you take them out and move them somewhere else, in my opinion. Um, but it depends on the species. But if they're able to eat uh, food that you're giving them, and they're doing well, and they're able to swim around, you can move them whenever you want. You're not gonna hurt them by transporting them unless they still have their uh, you know, uh, yolk sac still attached to their guts. At that point, you don't wanna move them. Once their yolks are fully absorbed uh, and they are swimming around looking for food, you can gently move them into another aquarium and you should be just fine. Cool. Uh, to do that, I would use a container and kind of shepherd them into it or a fine fish net and be super, super gentle about transferring them underwater uh, to minimize the amount of actual contact they have with air and the contact they have with solid things like the net or the container, et cetera. You don't wanna you know, have them dry in a net and bump them into a container. Anything you do like that could 
potentially damage them. Anyways. Okay, uh, last one. And again, this is a good example of uh, sending photos to our support team where they can actually help you. But we'll see what you got here. Sure. My aquarium got cleaned. They disposed of all the water. Now there is a white, smelly fog in the new water and my fish are going one by one. Please help. I have guppies and platies. This is what just happened. You destroyed uh, a good portion of the bacteria in the aquarium unintentionally. Um, the bad smell is probably from ammonia and also from uh, fish death. Uh, the white cloudiness is a bacterial bloom as the, the bacteria in the aquarium tries to reestablish itself and uh, basically go through that second cycle. You forced your tank to cycle again. And uh, it's not easy to get through this. So you're gonna have to do I would say probably 25% water changes twice a day to try to keep up with it, to, to prevent them from dying any further. You're gonna wanna grab a test kit if you don't have one. Everybody needs test kits. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have test kits, get test kits for ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite. And uh, you can test for ammonia. That's probably right now what's killing your fish. Nitrite could also potentially be doing it. And nitrate is where you wanna end up. You wanna have zero, zero, and have some amount, like around 20 uh, or 2.0 uh, in nitrate is okay. That'll tell you your cycle's over. You forced another cycle in your tank and it sucks. Yeah. It sucks. I've done it. When I was uh, a lot newer in the hobby, I had done that twice, two different systems, man. And I haven't done it since because Learn, the yeah. second time almost killed me. I had a gorgeous collection of catfish, like just random oddball catfish. And I lost them one by one and I had a horrible night. Shed tears. And you vowed never to let that happen again. Never again. Yikes. All right, guys. Well, that is uh, three questions. Uh, all all done and dusted. Yay! Uh, and that's another Q&A. Uh, all done now. Um, yay. All right. Well, was, was, we're, we're off our game. We're tired. There we go. Better. Huh. Oh, man. All right. So we're probably going to you know go get some, some sleep. Um, but with that said, thank you guys so much for... For, yeah, we're watching the playback of the high five, and it's just awful. Instant replay is terrible. Uh, again, thank you guys so much for joining <laughs> you us. You got to feel embarrassed twice. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Once just wasn't enough. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us, though. Really, we do appreciate you guys coming out for these uh, live Q&As every single week and uh, giving us your, your questions and having uh, our aquatics enthusiast and amazing video host here get the chance to interact with you in shucks. real time. So uh, It's a lot of fun. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Uh, it is a lot of fun. So uh, with that said, as usual, uh, if you like our vids, if you like our content, uh, the best way to support us is uh, if you're in the U.S., check out BigLspets.com. If you're in Canada, BigLspets.ca. Or even better, if you're in Canada and you live in one of our super centers. Works. Yeah, if you live near a super center, come check us out, man, because we really love those places. They're, they're a lot of fun oh, yeah. for the whole fam. Uh, so that's the best way to really support us and uh, ensure that we get to keep doing all the, these uh, awesome videos videos for you. Uh, but again, uh, anytime a video comes out, you guys liking it, sharing it, commenting, uh, we really do truly... Massive help for us. Yeah, we really do truly love uh, the, that support from you guys and interacting with you guys on that. Uh, check out that Planet Tank video that dropped yesterday. It's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And it's going to be bit. more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have a whole bunch of stuff coming. Like we said, a, a cool a cool project that's semi, semi-secret right now that you guys are going to hopefully love. Um, so stay tuned. Make sure you subscribe. Share us everywhere you can. And, uh, well, I guess as always, keep on tagging. Bye, Easy G the person. See yas.